So I'm going to do a personal talk um, with my connection with the Buddha, the Dharma, and to a certain extent, the Sangha as well. So I just want to go into my background, first of all. Um, so I was brought up in a Hindu family. Um, my mum had a very strong practice. Um, I remember very, I remember from a very small child, her sitting down and doing her pray, prayers on a daily basis. Um, these mainly consisted of reading from the Ramayan, which is a thick book, um, the story of Ram, doing pujas and chanting. Um, and I think I was the only one from the family who would sit with her when she was doing her prayers. It could be because I was the youngest and I didn't have much else to do and I loved my mum, so I just sat with her. But, but I think I was fascinated by her devotion. You know, she used to be in a different world when she did that, totally sort of tuned into that. So I think it was through that I developed um, faith from quite a very young age. Um, I always sort of wanted to connect with what she connected with, you know, something that was bigger, something bigger than beyond myself. So, um, so you know, there was this latent faith that I had so at the age of 16, I did my O-levels um, and it came as a bit of a shock when I failed them all. I'd never failed any exams before. I always did very well in studies and so on. Um, you know, there was great expectations of me. So it really did um, shock me, you know, um, it was a bit, bit of a blow to the ego as well. Um, luckily for me, um, the teachers allowed me to start doing the A-level course, um, provided I passed my O-levels in the December, so I had to reset them in the December. So the pressure was really on, and my mum suggested that I pray to Shiva. So Shiva is one of the ma three main gods in Hinduism. Um, there's Brahma, who is the creator of the world, Vishnu, who is the preserver, and Shiva, who's the destroyer. So I'm going to put an image of Shiva on the screen. So a lot of you may be familiar with this image, or maybe not, but um, here he is with his son, Ganesha, um, the elephant god. So I'm going to digress a little bit and tell you the story about um, Ganesha. So he, um, so Shiva had gone off into the mountains to um, do his meditation and he'd left his wife Parvati behind. And while he was gone, um, she made a little boy out of mud. Um, and that was Ganesha. And because she was a goddess, she put life into him. And um, so, so one day Shiva came back from the mountains and um, he came to his house and Ganesha was outside guarding um, the house because his mom was inside bathing. So he got very angry and he said, get out of my way. And Ganesha wasn't having it because he was protecting his mum. So in his anger, he chopped his head off. And then Parvati came outside and she was like, what have you done? And um, so he, Shiva sort of tried to sort of put the situation right, went off to find another head and he found the head of an elephant, um, a little baby elephant. So hence Ganesha's got the head of the elephant. Now make what you want of that story. You know, I'm sure there's some sort of a deeper hidden meaning under all of that but you know I, I didn't really get it so um anyway so we can leave the image on or not um so what my mum said to me is that Shiva fulfills all your wishes um she said you know pray to him so I started fasting on a Monday which is Shiva day um, so in Hinduism, you have lots of different gods and each god has a different day that you pray to them. So I did my fasts, I prayed to him. So when I redid my exams in December, I passed them. 
Um, so this really increased my faith in Shiva. I really believed that he could grant wishes. You know, all you had to do was pray to him. So, you know, my devotion to Shiva continued, but maybe not to the same extent. Um, I got married, had a family, so didn't really have a lot of time. But, but you know, that stayed with me. You know, what I felt for him stayed with me. So it wasn't until my purse, until I was in my thirties, um, my older sister, who I was very, very close to, um, she died. She died quite suddenly. Um, she suffered ill health for a number of years, but when she died, it was quite sudden, and it came as a bit of a shock. It wasn't expected, and I had a lot of difficulty dealing with her death. Um, I think my world must have fallen apart. I was under a lot of pressure as well at that time. I was working full time, looking after a family, studying. Um, I just felt I couldn't cope. Um, there was nothing that I could turn to. There was no refuge that I could turn to. Not even Shiva, you know, there was nothing, there was nothing substantial there for me that I thought, well, you know, I can go to him. Um, there, was, they didn't, there wasn't any foundation in the devotion that I had for him. It didn't answer my questions. So this affected my life in a very big way. Um, my marriage fell apart, my life fell apart, and it was just such a devastating time for all concerned. My husband, myself, the kids. So anyway, you know, um, life carried on. Um, I had a lot of things to distract me. I was um, a single woman again. Um, I had the freedom that I didn't have in my teens. So there was a lot of holidays, clubbing, drinking, socializing, but it just wasn't doing it for me. You know, deep down, I was unhappy. Um, there was a lot of dissatisfaction in my life. So anyway, it wasn't until I was 47, um, I came to Buddhism. Um, initially, it was for meditation. But straight away, Dharma had a very strong impact on me. Um, it seemed to answer seemed to answer the questions about life that I had. Um, and straight away, I developed a connection with the Buddha. It wasn't just his beautiful, peaceful, serene image, but it was what he represented as well. Um, I admired his qualities, his kindness, his compassion, his wisdom, equanimity, generosity, you know, all, I mean, all those qualities I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. So, you know, the fog started to lift a little bit. Um, you know, I started to understand life. I started to understand nature of reality. Um, and then, you know, when I look back to my time, um, you know, when I was so devoted to Shiva, there wasn't a single quality about Shiva that I knew about. It was just blind faith. It was faith that was based purely on what he could do for me. You know, it was kind of like a transaction. I prayed to him in the hope that he would give me something back and nothing beyond that. Um, you know, I, you know, I think maybe that's how it is in Hinduism. You know, you pray to gods, various gods. You have to please them in the hope that you get something back. Um, ethical behavior didn't come into it at all. It didn't make me a kinder or a nicer person. In fact, I think I was not a very nice person as a teenager. But, you know, none of that sort of came into it. So with my relationship with the Buddha um, and following his Dharma, I think it has made me a slighter kind of person. The thing that's made me realize is that how important conditioning has been, you know, how, what a big part is played in my behavior. 
It's also made me realize the effect that my actions have on others and myself. It's made me very aware of my likes and dislikes, my cravings, my aversions, and how difficult it is to give them up. And another realization for me has been the importance of spiritual friendships. Um, it's through my friendships that you know I've learned more about myself. Um, I've learned to be open about how I feel, how I have behaved, my unskill, unskillful behavior, sharing my thoughts, my deepest thoughts, getting feedback from friends, realizing that these friends are there for me when I need them. And, um, and also, you know, being friends to others, you know, it's really taught me how to open my heart, not to be judgmental, to practice generosity, you know, lovely qualities, you know, that the Dharma brings. So with the relationship with the Buddha, I don't have any deals with him. It's not up to him how my life pans out. He's not going to change the course of my life. I realize it's my actions that determine how my life is. He's simply shown me the way through the Dharma. So if I don't meditate, if I don't sit on my cushions, he doesn't judge me. Um, I might suddenly think, oh, I feel a bit disconnected and a bit out of sorts. And then I realize, oh, it's because, you know, I need to maybe sit more. I need to sit down and be still and calm. Um, if I'm not being very skillful, um, it's were, you know, it's because there's lack of awareness there. So there's no judgment there, you know. It, it is kind of like using his dharma, I kind of like walk my life, so to speak. So, um, so more recently, um, I've had some health concerns, um, which I must admit have scared me a little bit. But what I found was that I wasn't bargaining with the Buddha saying, please make me well, you know, take this, make this go away. But instead, I turned to the Buddha's teachings, um, his teaching on impermanence realizing that actually, you know, I'm not gonna last forever. I have this body, therefore old age and sickness will happen. I'm not any different. You know, we've recently had Parinirvana day and, you know, the Buddha too had a body and he too passed away. So the body in the end, this human body does just give up in the end. So that's one of the teaching that's been very present for me. And the other one has been unsubstantiality. You know, I was going to Kashavana on my ordination retreat. I had great plans. Tuli Mati and I had made great plans. We were going to travel together. We were going to spend a couple of days in Tarragona before going up to Kashavana. Uh, you know, what was three months on a retreat going to be like? You know, it's never... A, you know, it's not something I've experienced before. Well, COVID happened, didn't it? And I think all of you would relate to this, you know, it's changed our life completely. You know, there's no certainty in life at the moment, no certainty in what the future is going to look like. And just by this one little microscopic organism, you know, how bizarre is that? And the third truth is always dukkha, isn't there? There's always good old dukkhas there all the time, you know, dukkha of old age, dukkha of things not going the way we want to, you know, it's there all the time. So, um, so I just want to say that, you know, I'm not sort of saying that, you know, Hinduism isn't the right thing it wasn't the right thing for me you know it serves a lot of people it serves millions of people around the world it served my mum well until she died and but for me it served me it served me at the time you know it, it was there when I needed it 
and but it's a little bit like you know beauty and ugliness you know it's like sugar and a sugar I don't like to use the word ugly it sounds a bit strong but you know for me you know Buddhism and my connection with Shiva was beautiful at that time but the beauty the shubha of my relationship with Buddha is far more greater you know it gives me a lot of depth it you know gives me sort of like a connection with the nature of reality I feel you know I'm, I'm practicing to be a nicer person so yeah so I think um, that is my personal experience with you know coming into connection with the Buddha um, his teaching and you know the Sangha jewel so I'm just going to um, so I'm going to finish the talk off with um, some verses from the Dharmapada you know it's my favorite book whenever I'm looking for something I always find something in this and there's a little of well, you know, sort of my talk, some of the things that I've sort of pointed to in my talk are in here. So it's the way, there's quite a few verses, so I'll try and read them slowly. Um, best of ways is the eight, eightfold part of way. Best of truths are the four truths. Passionless is the best of mental states. The man of vision is the best of bipeds. This indeed is the way, there is no other, that leads to purity of vision. Enter upon the way, this way in, is the bewilderment of Mara. Following this way, you will make an end of suffering. This indeed is the way proclaimed by me ever since. I knew how to draw out the darts of craving. But you must, but you must the zealous effort be made. The Tadagatas, the Buddhas or enlightened ones, are only proclaimers of the way. Those who are absorbed in higher meditative states eventually win release from the bondage of Mara. All conditioned things are impermanent. When one sees this with insight, one becomes weary of suffering. This is the way to purity. All conditioned things are painful. When one sees this with insight, one becomes weary of suffering. This is the way to purity. All things whatever are devoid of unchanging selfhood. When one sees this with insight, one becomes weary of suffering. This is the way to purity. One who does not make use of the spiritual opportunities, who though young and strong is lazy, weak in aspiration and inactive, such a lazy person does not find the way to insight. Guarded in speech as well as controlled in mind, let one do no unskillful thing with the body, purifying these three avenues of action. Let him attain the way made known by the sages. From application arises the spiritually great. From lack of application, the spiritually great wanes. Having known these two avenues of increase and, or, and decrease, let him so establish himself that the great may flourish. Cut down the whole forest, not just one tree. From the forest arises fear, cutting down both wood and brushwood. Be out of the wood, Elmsman. To the extent that one has not cut down the last bit of this brushwood of craving of man for woman, to that extent his mind will be fettered as a sucking calf to his mother. Cut off your sticky affection as one plucks with one's hand the white autumnal lotus. Develop the way of peace. 
the nirvana taught by the happy one. Here shall I stay during the rains, here in the cold season and the hot. Thus thinks the spiritually immature person, he does not understand the dangers to life. That infatuated man who'd, whose delight is in offspring and cattle, death goes and carries him off as a great flood sweeps away a sleeping village. Sons are no protection, nor father, nor yet other relatives. For him who is seized by the end maker, i.e. death, there is no protection forthcoming from relatives. Knowing the significance of this, let the spiritually mature person, the man restrained by good at conduct, speedily cleanse the way leading to Nirvana. Okay, so I do just want to read this poem as well. I know there's a lot of reading and a lot to take in, but um, I, I absolutely love this poem. I think those of you who were here for the Parinirvana Day would have heard it. So this is Kukai's letter to a nobleman in Kyoto. You ask me why I entered the mountain deep and cold, awesome, surrounded by steep peaks and grotesque rocks, a place that is painful to climb and difficult to descend, wherein reside the gods of the mountain and the spirits of trees. Have you not seen, oh, have you not seen, the peach and plum blossom in the royal garden. They must be in full bloom, pink and fragrant, now opening in the April showers, now falling in the spring gales. Flying high and low, all over the garden, the petals scatter. Some sprigs may be plucked by the strolling spring maidens and the flying petals picked by the flittering spring orioles. Have you not seen, oh, have you not seen the water gushing up in the divine spring of the garden? No sooner does it arise than it flows away forever. Thousands of shining lines flow as they come forth, flowing, flowing, flowing into the unfathomable abyss. Turning, whirling again, they flow on forever and no one knows where they stop. Have you not seen or have you not seen that, brilliant, that billions have lived in China, in Japan? None have been immortal from time immemorial, ancient sage, kings or tyrants, good subjects or bad, fair ladies and homely. Who could enjoy eternal youth? Noble men and lowly alike, without exception, die away. They all have died, reduced to dust and ashes. The singing halls and dancing stages have become the abodes of foxes. Transient as dreams, bubbles or lightning, all are perpetual travellers. Have you not seen, oh, have you not seen? This has been man's fate. How can you alone live forever? Thinking of this, my heart always feels torn. You too are like the sun going down behind the western mountains. Or a living corpse whose span of life is nearly over. Futile would be my stay in the capital. Away, away, I must go. I must not stay there. Release me, for I shall be master of the great void. A child of Shinon must not stay here. I have never tired of watching the pine trees and the rocks of Mount Koya. The limpid stream of the mountain is the source of my inexhaustible joy. Discard pride in earthly gains. Do not be scorched in the burning house. The triple world. Discipline in the woods alone lets us soon enter the eternal realm. Thank you very much.